first question, Pastor, uh, Apostle. Um, it says, it seems like there are only few leaders and many followers. There's only one Joseph, there's only one David, and one Solomon. So is it okay if I'm one of the followers? There's so many are, there's only few, are only few called to be influencers, and the rest of us are supposed to follow. I will answer that. Thank you. There are 8 billion people in the world. Why should you be a follower? 8 billion people in the world. Why should you be a follower? Why shouldn't you be a leader? You understand what I'm saying? The, I always tell people that the vacuum, I mean the, the sky, the, the, the top is, is a vacuum. When the Bible says that you shall be the head and not the tail, the Christian was not called to be least. That's not our calling. But don't mistake that for the fact that you cannot uh, submit or be mentored. You understand? We too submit and are mentored and are taught. You see what I'm saying? But we are saying that the language here should be you are trained from being a follower to a leader. And when you're a leader, you are a follower to one, but yet a leader to others. You see what I'm saying? That, that's, that's the symbiotic relationship. And then you lead others. They become leaders too. You, you read what it, what it was. Leaders having influence and raising other what? Leaders. And it's through that that we continue to raise this DNA that starts to permeate through the systems and structures of society. But you should not have the mentality that you are only meant to follow. At least if you are meant to follow, follow into a leadership. Continue following and raise more leaders as well. But the, like I said, 2.7 billion Christians of the 8 billion people. And all the rest, the, the numbers that are not yet born again in the world are looking for you. So God is looking for you. We already have more, much demanding than we're able to give now. Next question. Warren Buffett and Trump, people like this, they do business by borrowing. How can it work out without foundational investment and capital if you want to start something? If borrower is slave to the lender, is this okay to do? In the short term, yes. Because borrowing is wisdom. Eh? You, you must borrow in wisdom. We were talking with Bishop recently. <laughs> Some people, you want, for example, $2 million for a business, you borrow $2.5 million because you need half a million dollars to buy yourself a car, which is a non-performing asset. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. We agree that there are instances where you will borrow and agreeable in the sense that you are borrowing to invest and agreeable that in the investments you're going to have profits and income consequently and then plan that and say, this is for this period for me to come out of this. That's understandable. You understand? But we have people who are lifetime borrowers. Mm, mm. The, 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 for as long as they remember you, you have somebody's money. Mm. Yeah? No, no, no. <laughs> Bishop, can you add on that? Yes, sir. <clears throat> there is uh, what they call good loan and bad loan. Okay? You must be smart enough to know which is good loan and which is bad loan. We had, uh, when I was... Um, in Narsapur, we borrowed, my wife and I borrowed 25,000 rupees from a bank to start a vocational school in, in our Bible school. And then we, we, we realized how much interest we paid at the end of the, the payment. <clears throat> then we made a vow, we will never borrow money again. Okay? That is one lesson. But then, maybe about uh, 20 years ago, we went to, we took our boys to America for their higher studies, and then we lived there for about 15 years, and then um, during that time, we, we started with a rented house, and then some people uh, spoke wisdom to us, and then we decided to buy a house. And then at that time, we, then we, we discussed about, is it good to borrow? We don't have enough money, so why should, what should we do? Then we, we, we learn about this is a good loan. Instead of paying $1,200 to $1,500 as a, as a rent, we use that as our payment 
of our, our loan. And then we, that is how, and then we entered into a 30-year uh, loan, but then we cleared it in 10 years. See, we, we aggressively put uh, towards this, we did not sleep over that uh, loan. We, we did not sleep, and we, we uh, every extra little money we found, we took care of the loan, and then we became uh, uh, debt-free in 10 years, and it was wonderful. Yeah. <clears throat> and now, by the grace of God, there is no debt in our lives. Amen. Yeah. Next question. What does being bold as a Christian leader in the world of business mean? Going back, the loan's interest was 4%. The loan interest was 4%, 5%, 5%. And then uh, uh, it was very, very low. So that is a good loan. So that is a good loan. So you must be smart enough to, to take that and make use of it and then even make money with it. Amen. Yes, I'm sorry. That's okay. What does being bold as a Christian leader in the world of business mean? Actually, that's a very important question. Firstly, why that's an important question is because many times we confuse pride with uh, a humble confidence. There are two things. You can be a proud individual and you can be humble yet confident. I don't know whether you see that difference. And it has happened both in individuals. You know, and sometimes when you're raising children, you can see it. There are some kids who can grow and then you see they, they are getting a certain form of pride because of what their father and mother have. And as a parent, you have to tame it and tell them, look, I'm not killing your confidence. I want you confident, but I want you humble because the way of life will want you humble in what God has given you. So when we're talking about boldness for a Christian, number one, we're talking about a confidence in God, one that knows who you are, two, that knows whose you are, above all, that has a vision and understands that greater is he which is in you than he which is in the world, but carry the wisdom to walk with it in humility. In humility. That's a very important thing. All right, next question. Sometimes it is very difficult to practice our faith in the business world. Sometimes we may have to do things which are against our own beliefs. Is that okay? And to what extent can we go? I'll, I'll, give, you, uh, I'll give you some context to this question. I think what, what they mean by beliefs is moral beliefs like if you have to bribe somebody and things like that practical things that we face in in our nation why do you call them practical <laughs> <laughs> but they they might they, they might brush our moral compass in the wrong way so how do we you want to go past Peter? well uh, don't be ashamed of your faith do not be ashamed of your faith don't be intimidated don't let anyone else even the richest person in the town intimidate you because of your faith. You be bold and you honor God. You know, Bible clearly tells us if you honor, He will honor you. If you honor Him, He will honor you. The honoring Him is to declare that you are a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that is one, uh, that it should start with that. And then the moral, the, the, the practicalities. You know, uh, uh, we don't manipulate making the, the, the entertaining the wrong thing. You don't manipulate the officer. You don't ma manipulate and make them do wrong things. But then, you know, even to do right things, they're expecting something to, to do for them. And then, so I personally... Don't be too fussy about it. Give the dog a little bone and then save your time. Can I add? I love this man. Now, let me add on what Bishop has said. Number one. There are fundamentals, for example, in business. Okay? 
for anybody who has done business longer uh, for some time, there are things you know are fundamentals. For example, I believe in rewarding what grows me. That's a principle. If somebody adds to me, I reward them. That's who I am. And it's not wrong because that's honoring somebody whom honor is due, custom to whom custom is due, praise to whom praise is due. If, for example, a guy brings me a deal, X, and I do it, and it's a success, and I make $10,000 off it, $20,000 off it, I can give him two, three, four, five thousand. As the Spirit of the Lord, what? Impresses it. I am rewarding what has grown me. But if a guy comes and says that for me to get that business, I have to pay him that much, now that is corrupt. You understand what I'm saying? And that's why I have the problem, because I don't know how to receive uh, from the hand that God has not sent to give me. You understand? There's, there's an end to everything, and the end usually comes in which hand has really provided for you. You know, there is something, so the Bible speaks of people who are enemies of the cross, and the Bible says their God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame. It is, um, it's not a rewarding experience for a Christian to have shame in your glory. Okay, I got this, but the way I got it is shameful. You get where I'm coming from? And that's where we have to go to the next level of really praying for our nations. Because you enter offices and almost every office mm, mm. is what? Is corrupt some way. You cannot get justice because systems are corrupt. You can't. And that's really the work of Christians. Because in some instances, and I, I understand where some people are, some of you are in places where you even have no, you, you, you cannot come out. A good, a, even the system has made you a bad person. You're not that person. But it has pushed you into making decisions and doing things that are not honorable before God. So, one, there you require a lot of wisdom in how to deal and trade. Uh, for example, for me, when I was working in the organizations, one, I, I set a rule around me that there are certain things people around me know I don't do. Yeah? That's what he's saying. When you become born again, there are things people know you are not supposed to do. And mm. the, the earlier you create that vision, uh, that, 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 uh, that, that, that impression early, the better. Because remember, uh, character is the deepest definition of integrity. Mm. And if your character cannot be defined in the purpose and will of God, then God cannot entrust you with more. You understand? So... I'll give a similar picture example. One time a guy wanted to rob the bank. And then he, because then I had keys and systems, I had many passwords, there was a way I could transfer millions of dollars and the bank would not arrest me. Why? Because I was in the beginning of the system, I knew the system, and I have passwords of people whose prints are eh, in the system. And if I did that transaction, it would look like someone else did it, not me. You know that kind of thing? But he wanted to reward me. And, and I needed money during that time. Masharabade. You see, but there's that thing in me that always told me you're bigger than this. Because the one in you is bigger. Amen. The one in you is what? <clears throat> bigger. And every time I see that in my spirit, I realized I could not settle for less. And I find myself always being what is right even if it means being a little broke and some of your peers will go beyond you. But it's okay. It's okay for me to earn that little and know it is coming from the hand of God. Because eventually the table stand. And years later, the Lord starts to prosper me. And I start to see the hand of God that comes with his blessing. Mm. I think it's a satisfaction to know that I don't need anything if God has not provided it. Godliness with contentment is much gain. Yes. All right. Um, as you mentioned, Apostle, there's so many Jews that, uh, and unbelievers that have changed the world by translating many things from the spirit realm and made it into inno inventions and innovations, building many things that believers did not do. Why do you think that is so? And why has the church failed in realizing this kind of innovations are also inside of us? The church lost the pattern. Let me explain the pattern. How many of you know the scripture that says 
that God has blessed us with all spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Mm. Is he going to bless us? Amen. He has blessed us. You understand what I'm saying? Is he going to give it to you next week? He has given it to you. You agree? There's another portion that says God has given us everything that pertains to life and God has. Is he going to give you or he has already given you? Given you. He has already given. So, if you have been given all things that pertain to life and godliness, you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly place in Christ Jesus, what is the pattern that connects you not only to those things, but brings these things to manifestation? Those are called fundamental laws. Okay? And this is what, like I said, the church lost. And I'll say it in a few minutes because we have many questions to answer. You all agree that everything in existence began from a world that is not seen. Huh? Hebrews 11. Is it? By faith. Verses 3. Can you put it up for somebody to see? Hebrews 11 verses 3. It says, by faith we understand that the, the, the worlds, the eons, the word there for, for worlds is Eon, not cosmos, not this physical world, but spiritual. Yeah? Like if you find a mad guy walking on the road, you can say that guy is in his world. That means he has an eon that has defined a certain rules and, 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 and life that you who is thinking right is not able to what? To connect to. He's eating from the garbage, you're eating from a plate. He's not bathing, you're bathing. He's in another eon, right? Let me tell you a mystery. When the Bible says by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, it means what the word of God gave us were eons. Isn't it? So that the things which are seen were not made about by things which are visible. That means everything created in the world was created by something that is not seen. And by faith, the understanding of these things is in the realm of the eons. Let me explain something small about the eons, Bishop. We were talking yesterday, a few days ago with them at home at dinner and we were discussing with me some of the properties or things they bought years ago that were cheaper and now are more expensive. You understand what I'm saying? That means that there's a progressive law in the spirit realm that grows and advances things every, every time time evolves. Because time is fourth dimensional. Every time, every time time evolves, chronos huh? and kairos, which is of God, chronos, your earthly timing, Every time this clock goes like that, huh? forward, it means that the world is moving what? Forward. You agree? And the prophetic realm is circular. Even though it moves forward, Ecclesiastes says that which was, is, and shall be. And that's what the clock does. It goes to midday and clocks like that and comes back to midday. It's forward, but it's in circular. And either it can be a spiral going upward or a spiral going what? Downward. So things in the spiritual realm are repeating themselves. That means every hour of your life, every time of your life, there are windows that define circles where you can evolve. That if you messed up once, you can come back in a circle one day and correct it. The loop. Yeah, that's true. You remember the, lamp, the man who was at the well? Crippled for 38 years? He says, every time I want to get into the world, somebody goes there before me. So that means every time the cycle came, he missed his timing. Every time the cycle came, he missed this timing. And there are many people who miss the timing. Okay? Now, let me conclude this. If you bought a property in... Uh, how much, for example, was an acre costing in India 30 years ago? How much was an acre of land in Hyderabad, Central, Secunderabad? How much did an acre cost 30 years ago? $200. Are you hearing? In that eon, $200 would buy a what? An acre. How much does an acre cost in 2022 in Hyderabad? Two million. So, in the eon of 30 years ago, you only needed $200. They are all dollars. But in the eon 30 years ago, you needed $200 to buy an acre. In 2022, you need $2 million to buy an acre. That means that if you get stuck in the eon 30 years ago, you're not going to own land in 2022. You understand what I'm saying? 
because the eons, the time has evolved and it has come with its provision. You, you Christians read from glory to glory. Eh? From grace to grace. From faith to faith. That's what's happening in the spirit realm. You agree? Now, if you find some... Do you know there are people in the world who cannot afford a 2022 phone? They can't afford it. No, there are some who don't have it because they don't need it. But there are people in 2022 who can afford a, a phone, an S8, which was released in 2015. So that means spiritually they are in 2015. But physically they are in 20 what? 2022. You understand what I'm saying? To catch up with the times means that there has to be a power that makes things available in their own timing and they are agreeable with you to afford them. Are you following what I'm saying? Now, and it, it comes from this. You must learn how to get things in the spirit realm that are invisible and turn them to the visible. That is on the three pillars. Purpose. I mentioned it. Revelation. Meditation. Meditate to create. Those are the three pillars. You must know how to go beyond, oh, I want to build, to sitting to build. There was a, I'm sorry, I'm going to give you a small example. Recently, my wife wanted me to build something for her. It was a lot. And I sat, every time she was going to bed, I used to switch on the TV and I look at it on YouTube. Two, three hours, just sitting and looking. And then in my head, I'm trying to build. I'm meditating. I'm creating. And I'm speaking it. I'm meditating, creating, speaking. Because I know it's in the spirit. But I want to first get the vision. Oh, you want to build a house. But which house do you want to build? Do you even have a vision of which house you want to build? You don't have build. You, you don't have a vision yet fully of the house you want to build. And you want to bring it in the physical realm. Even before you go to the architect, have a clue. You understand what I'm saying? So I did that and I created this thing in my head. And in the third month, somebody walked to us as a couple and gave us a property for free. And that very month, the Lord is my witness, a deal broke and brought all the money for the project to build it where my wife wanted it. And it happened in a space of three months. And how that money came in that very period was a provision of something coming from that realm. How that property came for free to me was a provision of coming from that realm. And everything reconciles for me. And in three months, I'm able to build whatever my wife wants. I'm giving you an example. But how many people think that you need to save money for 20 years? You see the difference between two worlds? Because you've not learned to meditate and create. You've not learned to find purpose in the thing that you are doing. And you've not learned to function in the spirit of revelation. All right. Um, another question is, how do you start when you have been... Uh, how do you start to dream big when you have taught not to dream big? How do you start to dream big when you are taught not to dream big? When you... <laughs> because I was taught not to dream big. And I was taught that is spirituality. That is humility. To be poor is godly. To be uh, not uh, aiming for high, aiming for high education, high position is godly. And then the Christian church is a victim of that thought pattern. So now, on, on this day, we are seeing so many dimensions. And then even... He is introducing the, the word meditation. And don't think about uh, uh, when you heard the Eastern that, meditation. Yeah, about Rajneesh or uh, some Yoga. Other, uh, the, who is the other fellow that is, comes very much? Yeah, the, don't think of them. There is uh, a strong meditation in the Bible. So we need to learn to meditate on the word of God, on the things of God, and then rising up in the spirit to the greater, greater heights. God bless you. <clears throat> Thank you, Bishop. The other thing I need to add is you can only, well, like you said, 
and I can relate with it to coming from Africa, third world, second world, we, we usually have that mentality, you are raised poor. You're going to school to make money. So you wake up with this whole mind every time you, you were told you were poor, huh? and you're trying to become what? Rich. That's the vision they gave you. And I thank God for our generation, because now we know how to teach our children better. Look at how Jesus came to this world. Jesus is a typical example, yes? Born by a woman in a womb, raised normal, humble guy, needs 30 years of preparation to do miracles, signs, and wonders. But look at the end, when Jesus is in the middle of his ministry, the statement he says. He says, to, for, to this end came I into the world, and for this cause did I come as a witness. To this end came I into the world. I mean, Look at how Jesus did it. Jesus, by wisdom, revelation, was taken to the end of things. And after that, for that cause, he came in the world. Jesus was not physically crucified as the, in the same bearing of the spiritual crucifixion. The spiritual crucifixion took place long ago. Isaiah talks about it. He was wounded. But how many of you know Isaiah came before Jesus? Right? So Jesus walks a pattern of revelation that takes him to the end of all things. The psalmist says, I have seen the end of all things and the word of God has become broad. By the spirit of God, God has to take you to the end of all things. And that is the revelation of his vision concerning your life. And from that end, you come to begin. When you begin your journey with the revelation of the end, you're different from someone who has begun a journey and they're not sure of the end. You get the difference. Um, what the Bible came to give us, and the Bible says, I know the thoughts that I have for you. Thoughts to make you prosper, not to harm you, to give you a future and hope. Next slide. An unexpected end. That means if your end is not defined, you cannot carry the revelation of God's plan over your life. Whoever is like that, first begin from saying, okay, besides whatever was given me, what is your revelation of me? Allow God to deal that journey with you. Because when you have a vision of life, you'll deal with the issue of doing, dealing small. Because already that is the, you, God will show you the end of it. And when he shows you the end of it, then you'll come and begin knowing where you're going. The milestones of destiny are already defined. That's a man living on, in purpose. Amen. Amen. All right. So this is a big question. <laughs> I'm an, a senior level management employee in a multinational company. I've always had a desire to start my own business and I've tried to do, them, do it more than five times, but somehow have failed at it and I have been back to the corporate rat race. How do I break out of this cycle and move forward in the purposes and calling of God on my life? Amen. Do it again. Do it again. Attempt again. Don't be scared of the failure. And then... Uh, then make sure you are doing it by the faith of Jesus Christ. You add faith. All your intellectual abilities and uh, your capabilities, giftings and uh, uh, abilities, you add faith. And then trust in God. Be humble before God. And then walk humbly before God. And then he will rise, raise you up. Let me add on Bishop. Actually, it's so interesting. The pendulum swings between those two. Mm. It swings between faith, because many people not, don't know how to believe God. Mm. That's a very powerful thing, Bishop, that you just said. You could go in it, but you are not able to believe God. And so you go with it in fear. The pendulum swings from the realm of fear, sorry, from the realm of faith and faithfulness. The Bible says a very powerful statement. It says, if you are not faithful in another man's, who will give you your own? It's a very powerful thing. Who will give you? That means every man faithful in another man's will be given their own. And that's the one thing many working people don't understand. You are not faithful, for example, and I'm not saying that exactly the person I'm speaking to is there. Perhaps you, your issue has been faith and it's handled. But there's also another person here on this pendulum of, 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 of swing that... If you are not faithful, I'm just going to give you an example. 
<laughs> That's not the scripture I'm looking for. Can I look for it, for it because of, for, just for that person? Hmm? Let me get it for you. If you, if you have it and you, you, you just shout it out, we don't care. Luke 16 verses 12. Luke 16 verses 12. Very important. Very important. What does it say? Let's read. One, two, three. Let's go. If you're not faithful in another man's, who will give you what is your own? That means uh, there are people in the script, there are people in the spirit realm called destiny helpers, vision helpers, or funders, partners. God has created people in your life. Like Bishop Benjamin met me when I was serving a man of God, washing toilets. And you know what he told me? He told me, I am going to take you on every pulpit I'm able to take you. And I'll do it because I love God and I believe in what's on your life. That's how I started moving across the world. Eh? You understand what I'm saying? What did he give me? He did not give me money. He gave me opportunity. You understand what I'm saying? He gave me opportunity. And this man, among very few people I know, would take a flight and tell you, I have gone to this state to talk to this pastor so we can arrange a meeting for you. He's not going there to do anything. He's just taken a flight to make sure that Apostle Grace has a sermon to preach in a, in a nation. I cannot pay him for that. You understand what I'm saying? But God has used him as a tool to advance my ministry. That's why I'm in Hyderabad. He has paid my tickets. Are you seeing what I'm saying? But he found me serving another man. Remember, never forget this. You don't reap where you sow. You reap what you sow. Not where. Some of you are annoyed. They have been doing this. They are not paying me. I'm faithful. I'm working so hard. But my boss doesn't look like they understand my work. Because you were not meant to reap where you sow. You are meant to reap what you sow. And some of you, the seeds that you have sown in one place, you might never reap, but you will reap in another. Is that okay? Amen. But let me conclude this. Let me conclude this. When I was banking, I told myself, because one day I want to start business, and I knew Luke 16, 12, I used to come on time. Because I'm preparing to have my you do your reports on time because you're preparing to have yours. You are faithful with your employer's uh, resources because you are trying to what? To be faithful to, to, because you're going to have your own one day. Are you seeing what I'm saying? And when you are faithful, now I see when I'm running ministry, Fanero, it's millions of dollars, it's many people serving, it's many volunteers. I'm using the same ethic or ethos that I was using in the bank. God has given me now an organization that is international and I'm managing it with a very, very understanding of some of the things that I learned in the other system. Are you following what I'm saying? So some of you you need to understand that probably the reason why you cannot start your own business, you are not even faithful with your employer's time. You get into the organization and put on solitaire. All right. Um, is it okay to have a small vision? Uh, and how do I pray for a large vision? It's, it, it's not okay. It's not okay to have, especially if you are a believer. If you are a born-again believer, it's not okay to live for yourself. You have to live beyond yourself. Amen? Amen? Every one of you, dream big and have a vision that will make difference beyond your family. Yeah, and, and then this, uh, developing a big vision is simple. You don't have to be sophisticated, extremely educated. You look others and, and learn. You look others and copy. Copy 90% of what I do. 
what I, I have uh, done in my life, I copied from others. That's why China is rich. <laughs> See, don't, don't waste your time. That's all. Okay. Uh, so we're going to steer it a little bit towards more of a church and organization side. Um, what's the difference between having crazy faith and being unwise in, within an organization? Oh, crazy faith. On it. I think... I think the question should have been, what's the difference between having crazy faith and uh, manifesting the acts of faith but without the results of them? Yeah? Because the answer was in that question, wisdom. Because wisdom is, the Bible says, is the reconciler of both realms. Eh? Um, we have had Christians, like I gave a typical example in the training, uh, in, the, in the session earlier. Let's go back to the thing many people don't want to hear. Huh? Let me, please, take, let me take you back to what I haven't had time to say, but I'm going to repeat it again because somebody asked a question. If you are not a sower, how do you expect to reap? Let's have that simple conversation. You're not a sower, right? Okay, maybe you might not understand it in your money terms because you think the church wants to rob you, you have a field and you're not planting seeds for food. And at the end of every harvest, you want to walk into that field and get what? A harvest. Is that possible? It's not possible. Basic common sense would tell you that if you're going to eat food, go and plant something in there. My problem is the person who does not even have that common sense and they're going to wait for a harvest. It's the same thing we're talking about. Faith is as a result of hearing and hearing by the word of? Do you agree? Luke 8:11. The parable is that the seed is the word of God. So the word of God are like seeds planted in your heart. Your heart is the ground. You remember the story of a farmer went to plant seeds. Some went, fell on the hard ground. Some fell on the rocky, soft ground. And they... The, 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 the Bible says now it starts to explain the kind of folds they have and how some receive back 30 folds, some 60 folds, some 100 fold. And God is telling us, according to how much seed we are able to plant in the ground and how we are able to plant it with the kind of seed we plant, that defines our 30 fold, our 60 fold, or our 100 fold. We all have different results. Are you agreeable? Now, the secret here is simple, especially if you're serious about being a success in this world. Fall in love with the word of God. I have many business people here today. You are, you don't take the word serious. Today you are in church, tomorrow you're not. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed. You take a month without coming, then you come another month, you assume you know it because you have a good kind of house. But you're missing something because you, there's something bigger than that car and house. I tell people, when you get into the word and say, the psalmist says, I desire the word of God more than sincere food. Amen. We people who are business people and are rich and are successful, we're supposed to give the example in the church. Don't miss service. Begin with telling God that many things have priority, but the word of God has priority above all. I tell people, I don't build my faith around my schedules. I build my schedules around my faith. My faith comes first, and the schedules what? That's what Bishop Ores used to tell me, put God first. Put God first. So I think, for me, go back to the principle of the seed and the harvest and understand that whatever you're, you're going to believe God for, whatever crazy faith you're going to have, I'll tell you an example when I'm going for healing meetings. Sometimes I want to go back to the Gospels and read. Hmm? When I'm going for a healing meeting, I want to read something that Jesus did. What am I trying to do? I'm planting faith. And then I see that he's raised the girl from the dead and and as I'm reading, this, this thing is stirring my spirit. And, and I pray, speak in tongues for two, three, four hours, and I get on the pulpit, and I know a lame man must walk. Why? Because I planted the seed in my spirit. Amen. This is a bit of a tricky question. I, I, they've given a lot of details, but uh, I think this question should be answered. Um, so this person goes to a certain church, and, uh, and, and she considers uh, the pastor her um, 
your spiritual father. And the question is, if I have a vision from God to build this particular church in a different country, what should I have in my possession already? Or is this vision enough? You want to answer or answer? Okay. Visions are progressional. Let me say that. Way. Visions are what? Progressional. The vision Abraham had about God was different from the God he meets in Canaan. You understand? He has an encounter with God and calls the altar Bethel and calls it the house of what? God. He goes, does his businesses, has victories in different places. He comes back to the same place, has another revelation of God, and what was Bethel becomes El Bethel. What began as the house of God transitioned into the vision of the God of the house. So visions evolve and mutate according to how we grow and adjust to the will and purposes of God. Some people have stayed stuck because they've not received a new vision of God. And yet God is calling us progressively to become new. We're renewing our mind. Okay? When you come to these conferences, what are you doing? You're elevating your vision. And perhaps you walked in with another mentality and by the time you go out, you're going to go back with another mentality. You see what I'm saying? So visions are what? They are progressive. Now, you, God has told you, get, build the same church in another nation. Where you are now, that's the mandate. Okay? If you build that and God tells you build another, thank God. God tells you divert and do something else. Do what? Thank God. At the end of the day, I want you to know that this is a journey and God can even instruct you and tell you, build another two. What do you do? Do you say no? No. But the other mistake I see many people do is, when it comes to things like church, submit the vision to the man of God you submitted to. Why? Because he needs to speak a, a, a word over you. It's, that's why Paul was praying that I, uh, he prays for the church, the people that used to, the Macedonian church, you find him praying over them for the vision that they had for the church. But number two, and most importantly, sometimes it's important to hear the heart of your man of God in the vision that you carry if it is added to his ministry. Perhaps he knows people in that nation already and they are going to make your work easier. You see what I'm saying? Oh, you want to build a church, but who's going to pastor it? Those are details, but when you submit it to your spiritual authority, he always gives answers. All right, last couple of questions uh, as we close. Um, how do we connect the world of business with the spiritual world? How do you disconnect them? <laughs> the problem is many times in the church, when it comes to the financial matters and when it comes to the business matters, you think it is unspiritual. Thank you. You think it is not godly thing. So when you go to when you go to church on Sunday, you empty all your pockets, you put all the records at home, and then you put on a white shirt and go to church. Okay? But there is no difference. Christian man, a born again believer, Monday to Friday, Monday to Saturday, it's a continuation of Sunday. Thank you. Amen? So, uh, now that you came with a business hunger, business thirst, and then, uh, because God has put uh, within you uh, 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 dissatisfaction, you're not satisfied with what you have, where you are at the moment. So, you want to rise up and you are looking for uh, 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 ways and then uh, connections and then connect contacts and then ideas. And then, but then there are no contacts, no ideas apart from your faith. You continue in your faith. You walk in your faith. You are connected with the, the right person. Hallelujah. And then so uh, uh, you do that. You don't empty your pockets. You go with the fill the pocket to church and obey the voice of God there. Okay? Take your plans to the church. And then put them before God. God, I submit my plans, my strategy to you. This is my dream. This is what I want to accomplish. This is what I want to have a quality life for me and for my family. And this is what I want to give uh, to make difference in the kingdom. Amen. 
So that, uh, that way, uh, uh, your business becomes God's business, God's business becomes your business. Amen. That's our thank you. All right, last two questions. What are some of the daily affirmations that we can speak over ourselves so that we can be connected to the vision uh, and the purpose that God has called us to? Speak everything God has done. Okay? Don't leave, I, like I said, for those of you who are in the conference yesterday, the Hebrew language has no future tense. So don't speak in the future. I will be great. I will be wise. It won't work. You understand? I am great. I am wise. Everything around me is working. My ministry is growing every other day. As the path of the just shines bright and bright unto a perfect day. The longer I live, the bright I will shine. The paths are dropped with greatness. The lines are fallen in pleasant places. Divine health is mine. Speak in the now. That's the best. The, 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 the best. Amen. Mm. Amen. All right. Um, this is the last question. Is tithing enough or do we need to be, uh, do we need to give more? It's a twofold question. The second part of it is in our giving, is charitable, uh, is charitable giving the only kind or do we need to be more strategic in our giving? Okay. Let me answer that. Let, thank you that it's the last. Because, <laughs> no, not because of time. But there is something that has come to my spirit and it was important that somebody hears it today. Hmm? Like, that's a good question. Why? There are, well, let's first understand that there are various instructions in scripture of giving. And I'll say a few. Uh, first fruit, I read it yesterday, Ezekiel 44 verses 30. The tithe. And then... The vulnerable, the orphan and the widow, the poor, the prisoner. Yeah? We need to look after the poor. The Muslims call it zakah. See? We also have seed offerings. Yeah? You, you plant a seed in something and provoke or demand a, a demand on God for something. Is that something many Christians don't know? Yeah? The first time I wanted to earn... There's a certain amount of money I, I wanted to have, but I'd failed to have it, yet I was doing all the other principles. And I looked for a man who had it, and I gave him a seed. And I said, speak on my life. And in a few months, I, I saw that money on my account. Why? Because I provoked God through that seed. You understand what I'm saying? That's a very important thing. And then there's that third, that fifth perhaps, which builds the kingdom of the place that advances the church and the agenda of the church. Where are the messages I saw? I don't saw in things that don't have the word, but where the word is, I do. Now, those are variants. But let's go back to these two, first fruit and tithe. Let me show you a mystery. You remember in, in Malachi chapter 3 where he says, you shall bring of all your tithes, uh, verses 10. Let me show you something I never want you to, for, to forget. Malachi 3, 10. Malachi 3, 10. He says, bring all the tithes. Did you realize he didn't say, bring the tithes? Do you know tithe is not one dimensional? All there. Yeah, that's for another day. But it's not, tithe is not one dimensional. It's not one way of tithing. Okay? Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that he may, that there may be food in your house and try me now, says the Lord. He says, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will be no room enough to receive it. Now, let me explain something. The spirit realm has windows and doors. Hmm? Windows are realms of revelation. Doors, is the, doors are the power of opportunity. You get it? You, there's someone who has a master's degree in a job, but they don't have the job. Huh? They have a PhD, but they're not employed. The window open for them to access that PhD, but the door to get a job for that PhD is not there. The rest is not to the swift, battle to the strong, bread to the men of skill. But it says two things happen to that man, time and chance. Now, the Hebrew word for time is opportunity. You see? Now, doors are opportunity. Windows are revelation. You can only have doors as for the windows that you've had. Because windows define the realm of access, doors define the realm of opportunity 
and expression and application of what you have accessed. That's why when they call us for ministry, we say a door has opened. It's not a window. No, because that's the opportunity for me to express what God has given me through the windows of the Spirit. You, you see what I'm saying? So every one of us has windows and doors in the spirit realm. Access is connection to everything divine. Now, here's the mystery. When you study that word, I will pour out for you such a blessing, the literal Hebrew word there translates as, I will pour out a source of blessing. Are you following? It's not the blessing. You're not going to tithe and God will give you a car. No. You will tithe and God will give you a source that will give you the car. Amen. Are you following? So, because that's a source, the difference between charisma and charismatos, charismatos is the, 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 the miraculous faculty. Charisma is the gift that comes out of the miraculous faculty. Now, that means a man can tithe and get an idea for a multi-million dollar deal. Are you seeing, Bishop, how God works? You are tithing, and in tithing, you get a connection to the man who will take you to a man who will take you, like Reinhard was saying, to the man who will give you a multi-million idea. That means if you're not a tither, you're frustrating the window that will, pro, uh, that will it's supposed to um, advance your progress in the spirit realm. Now, you see the power of tithe? So someone is saying, I'm looking for an idea to become richer. Are you tithing? Because God says, if you do, I'll open that window. So for us, tithe brings ideas, innovations, inventions. It gives us concepts. It gives us those things that are necessary to bring the blessing. Are you following what I'm saying? So it is with the first fruit. The Hebrew word for first fruit is to, is, is when, the, when you ask any Hebrew rabbi, they'll tell you, if you buy a property, and it's in the name of uh, uh, Mr. Reinhard Kumanapale. And then he signs transfer documents to you. All right? You've bought it. It's yours. But it's in Mr. Reinhard's name. Mm -hmm. And then you go to the city council and you want to submit your plans for building or developing that property. Can the city council... Uh, give you the permit to build that project when the property is still in Mr. Reinhardt's name? No. No. Yet it's yours, you bought it. Are you getting the difference? You have to go through the process of changing that name and they rub off his name and put your name. Now the action of putting a name off your possession and a man's name and putting your name is called fast fruit. You're putting a name on a thing. That is why some people have things, but they're in, their they're in their names physically, but spiritually they are not. And that means one day they can go. Are we following what I'm saying? So, don't play with those two. Fast fruit and tithe, don't play with those two. Because you need the ownership and the source of the blessing of God on your what? On your lives. When you do that, now... The business executive, it will translate to that little small idea that will come in your head and somehow do something in the organization that will make your star shine and perhaps make your boss consider to promote you. But where did it begin from? From the tithe. Lastly, when you read down there, he says, I shall rebuke the devourer for your own sake and your, 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 you, sh you shall not cast off your, your fruit before time. Eh? There's a lady who came to me, she was barren for four years. Four. And then she told me, pray for me. And when I laid hands like this and said to pray, the spirit spoke boldly. She does not tithe. Bishop, I was in the middle, Father, in the name of Jesus, and the voice said, she does not tithe. I stopped praying right away. Immediately. And I told her, go and tithe. She told me, how does that? I told her, no, no, no. God has told me your womb is shut because you're not tithing. I'm not saying everyone's womb is shut, but for this one, the devourer could only be rebuked through the tithe. And I explained it. She tithed for two months. The third month she was pregnant. We didn't pray about it. So imagine how many things you have made barren 
because you are not faithful and uh, with little. Lastly, never put, I said it yesterday, never put your need above the principle of God. Because whatever you put above is your God. Whatever you put above is your God. Somebody says, oh, you know, I have a law and I can't tithe. Oh, so what are you telling God? That you cannot live without that, that money or without that job. And that's a dangerous place for us to what? To be. I hope I've answered very, 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 very clearly. Let's advance from that level. Let's not even... Uh, so when we give beyond, like some of us do, it is out of the revelation of how much has been given. When you know who you are and what you have, the revelation of that goes... Do you know in uh, Saudi Arabia, I was reading a story of our Maktoum. In Saudi Arabia, they don't tithe. They give 30%. Did you know? Muslims. Did you know Muslims give 30%? Do you know where they get it from? It's biblical. In the Old Testament, there are three tithes. <laughs> for the priest, for the widow, and the poor, and for the stranger, and the city. For you, we are asking you to give one only. <laughs> Bill Gates, go Google the word project pledge. Bill Gates gives 40% of his income a year. Al Maktoum gives 30% of his income a year. And the Christian cannot give a 10. And they're saying. <laughs> Thank you so much. Can we give a clap offering? Thank you so much. I think what we've heard is a truckload of wisdom today. I don't even know how we're going to carry it around. But we're going to figure it out. We're going to learn. We're going to get better. And the next time, you will hear stories about how this day has changed their lives. And we just want to say thank you. Can we all say thank you together? Thank you, thank you so much, Apostle. And uh, you may.